Hello, everyone. This is Rebecca Green for the Whiny Palooza podcast. And I am very excited today because I get to speak with a fabulous author, Meredith Rusu. Meredith, thank you so much for doing this with me today. Thank you so much for having me on, Rebecca. This is exciting. I'm excited to share the book with you and your uh, your listeners. Yes, for sure. And let me tell you a little bit about Meredith. She is a children's book author of more than 100 titles. I can't even believe that. That's amazing. Notably, <laughs> Silencio Bruno and Anna, Elsa, and the Enchanting Holiday. We all love Anna and Elsa. Yep. <laughs> um, There's a Yeti in My Tummy is her first original picture book. Best title ever, by the way. <laughs> and she lives in New Jersey with her husband and two young sons who may or may not have Yetis. <laughs> they do. They 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 very much do. All, all three. <laughs> well, I have to find out about this because I'm thinking I'm having a feeling that we all have Yetis. I yes. have a feeling. <laughs> so before we jump into the Yeti, tell us how you became interested in writing children's books. Yeah, I so I it's funny because I wanted to I knew that I wanted to be writing stuff for children's or working in children's it was originally children's television when I was a kid that I wanted to do. I have actually this really funny story that I, I remember as a little kid, I was watching Nickelodeon back then, and they showed this snippet of these two guys in like the writer's room and they were shooting Nerf guns at one another. And I remember as like a six year old being that's what I want to do. <laughs> That's what I, that's what I want to grow up to do. And I, when I've told my, shared that with my husband, he's like, oh, so you wanted to play yes. like, yeah, I guess, I guess I did. So, so I knew I wanted to write, I, I knew I wanted to do something with uh children's television or books for a long, long time. And since I'm on the East coast, uh, children's publishing was the much more accessible option. Cause otherwise I would have had to really move out to LA to, to do children's television. And so I wound up working in editorial for children's books um, for many years, and I kind of fell into licensed publishing, which is which was a mesh of the two, like the children's television and the children's uh, writing, because licensed publishing is stories based on toys and television and movies for kids. Oh. So that's that's how I have the Anna and Elsa book, and that's how I have Silencio Bruno. I was an editor in licensed publishing for so many years working with authors just like myself now and editing books to then like you know to for um to go against the different properties and then in 2014 I had my uh, my older son Matthew and I made the transition to uh, writing full-time instead and mm -hmm. write being on the authorial side of the licensed publishing because I'd worked with so many of the editors I knew so many of the properties and it kept growing and growing and then in 2020, during the lockdown, um, I wanted to I wanted to write some of my own stuff for a long, long time. That was what kind of gave me the the the, the kick I needed to really get this out there because there was like a shift in how much licensed work was coming through. Like you know all the all the you know job markets were were changing, and so I'm like, well, I need to need to need to put food on the table. <laughs> Yeah, yes, <laughs> let's try. Let's let's try and let's try and figure something out. But then I also had this idea. I can I can tell you probably. I'm sure that one of your questions is how I had the idea for the book. So I'll save yes. I'll save that nugget. But um, but in 2020 is when I had the idea, and um, so now um now I've got some of my own original work out there, which I'm like I'm I'm so I'm excited and proud of, and just the response from friends and family and community has just been overwhelming. So I'm really I'm really happy. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I think the title is amazing. Um, so, so let's talk about the book. Let's talk about what a Yeti is. You and I were talking about that and laughing about that. And tell us about the whole inspiration behind the book. Sure. So, so a Yeti is basically an, an abominable snowman. Um, I didn't, I didn't realize I was mentioning, I didn't realize like people didn't know that. <laughs> Clueless. I'm clueless. The, the, ironically, the original, um, the original, original title was "There's There's a Dino in My Tummy." Was it Dino? It was Dino. Be and um, because the it, so the inspiration for the story was my two sons, Matthew and Luke, um, during the lockdown were three and five years old. They're six and eight now, and they were in those preschool 
just going into kindergarten years and they had a they had a lot of big feelings. I bet. They still have big feelings, but you start to forget just how big the preschool feelings really were. And they were they were here 24/7. You're getting a full full display of all the feelings during a during a pandemic. And my older son Matthew would would always he would stomp around and he'd roar, he'd be larger than life all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and he would also wake up with this giant mop of bedhead that was like Yu-Gi-Oh in the morning. It was like, <laughs> awesome. and I remember one morning he came down and I'm like, oh, like, you know, so I, I was like, buddy, it's like, there's, there's like, there's a creature in your hair, like a dinosaur or a, a, a Yeti. And I was like, huh, that's, that's a really good idea for how to express big feelings in this kind of very visual way. And it was inspired by his, by his hair. That's amazing. <laughs> and, um, and all the, on all this, the, the, the craziness, like, you know, at the table, like, you know, the, the, the eating messy, they still do like, you know, well, Matthew doesn't Matthew's right. meticulous picking and Luke is like, <laughs> that's funny. They're all so different. Yes. Yeah. They, they play, they play off one another. They, they, it's cute seeing them uh, either mirror certain things in one another or just really know how to push one another's buttons. Oh, siblings Back are then, so good at that, especially yep. during the lockdown. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, Luke was even so small. He was three. He was just, he, it felt like he was internalizing so many of his poor Aww. little big feelings. And that was, so I had this idea really inspired by it, like mostly Matthew, but then for the whole series, both of their experiences with big feelings and how they're how they're how they're feeling them, how they're expressing them. And what I, you know, with this, with there's Yeti in my tummy. In the first one, it's about like, you know, this big larger than life Yeti that's coming, the little boy is imagining, but he's kind of also there. And it's 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 expressing his big feelings, like in the when the boy is stomping, it's Yeti stomps, and when he uh, is afraid that he can't kick the kickball right with his feet on the field, uses his butt. He's like, "Oh, there's a Yeti in my butt." <laughs> he whacks the ball. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, for, for the for the record, I will ask my children when they come home from school. I bet you every one of them knows what a Yeti is. I think it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> It's not just, it's not just you, but you know, if, 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 uh, if nothing else, then, um, helping kids with their, their, their big feelings, this book will also educate Absolutely. the world what a Yeti is. <laughs> awesome. So, okay. So through this book, through your children, you have really learned a lot about big feelings and how to, how parents, how we can be more effective. Can mm -hmm. you give us some tips how to effectively handle big feelings? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we need some tips. Some tips. I I I I keep saying to um to like you know when when the public my publisher and my um, um publicity team was saying you know what advice do you have for parents I'm like well I'm just I'm learning it myself like I I I'm just trying like you know it's figuring it out as I go. I mean, I think, so I think one of the things that I've found has helped me and one of the things I was trying to, to share in the book is that in, in the moment, it's so difficult when the kids are expressing those big feelings, when they're having, when they're in the middle of a tantrum, when they're in the, in the supermarket, just melting down on the floor because, because they wanted a dog toy and you don't have a dog, like, <laughs> Oh God, and, I can totally picture that. Yeah. And, and like, like things that like set them off. And in the moment, there's so many different factors because it depends on where you are and it depends on how you're feeling and what needs to get done and how on a scale of one to 11, where they're at with their, with their big emotions and not just the negative ones, the, the being too silly, being rough housing, like, you know, trying to push one another on the shopping cart. And, um, so in the moment, it's very hard to, 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 to keep your calm and try and reach them on a level that they can understand. And you basically, you do your best, right? Yes, you do your best to, to, to get, get past that, that moment and move on. And 
what I found when they were little was that um, when my husband was in the office, I would be texting him all these crazy things that had happened, things you can't make up at drop right? off or at school. Yeah. Like, like, like you're, you're like, this is our Tuesday. Like this is where we're at. And it's eight. Yeah. And I found that it helped to try and find the joy in the craziness, in the silliness, because it is frustrating and it's, it's hard, but when you're able to, when you're able to try and laugh about it, when you're able to try and approach it from a perspective of these little tiny people have a very unique way of expressing themselves. And when I looked for the joy, I found that I was happier myself I and I found that I was, so able, much. I felt like I was able to appreciate the boys for who they were, but also who they were in that moment in time, that snippet in time. And so with Yeti in my tummy, you see the antics of the little boy all day, but I was, uh, you know, and at the end and how the parents and the teachers are trying to guide him to make, uh, like, you know, to use his big energy toward constructive, uh, uh, constructive things. But my hope was that in the quiet moments, when kid parents are reading these, this with their kids, they can be like, you know, Earlier, when you uh, when you almost tipped the full shopping cart over and like killed yourself, <laughs> when you and and shattered everything, you were you did you have a yeti in your tummy? Uh huh. And and however the kids want to express that, I've had kids at some of my book readings, like when I'm sharing the story times, some have said my yeti's purple, my yeti's blue. I don't have a yeti. I've got a monster. That's all great. That's exactly what I was hoping parents would be able to share with their kids through this. So my advice, my, my tips, try search for the joy to save your sanity. Yes. And save, then, and then, save yourself. Yes. And then use that joy in the quiet moments to try and try and connect with your kids. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it, sometimes it absolutely <laughs> works. I think that's such good advice. And I, and I have this whole picture of you with your kids because, and I want to tell you why, you know, my husband came up with the title whiny palooza, which uh -huh. has, which has become a joke in my family. Mm -hmm. And when my kids would be having a meltdown, I mean, they're, they're, you know, a couple of them are teenagers. They can still yeah. have a meltdown. Yeah. Um, we now have a joke that, you know, cause it's whining and it's a party. So we're like, it's whiny palooza all over the place. And we all start yeah. laughing. And I'm picturing <laughs> that with the Yeti in your tummy with your kids saying yeah. like, they're having a meltdown and you're like, oh, the Yeti is coming out. Like I can mm -hmm. totally see joking around and being silly and making it funny. Yeah. As a bit like a visualization that they can, they can then kind of hopefully latch onto and be like, Oh, this is, this is reaching that, that, that bananas level where the Yeti comes out and yeah, exactly. Anything, anything to try and connect with them on some sort of level that they can then talk with you about. It's, it, it's, it's so it, it just, it just real quick. It's so cute when my little guy who's six now, he'll have feelings that he doesn't know how to explain. He was trying to explain to me yesterday and he gets so like he went not like bawling, but like the the one the one tear coming yeah. down his his little cheek, and he's so like, sick. I have um I have these memories from the past. This is what he's like. He's like saying, I have these memories from the past, and I I feel sad that they're in the past, but I don't know how to. It's tricky to explain. And I'm like, and in my head, I'm like, he's experiencing nostalgia. <laughs> Oh. But how do you explain that to a six-year-old and so you know That's we have so precious it's really cute yeah <laughs> they have so many feelings so many mm -hmm. feelings and you know you're talking about connecting with our kids which I think is so important but what I also love is that you connected with your son's teachers yes and you yeah. said that changed everything so I am dying to hear about this they, these, these women, like, I can't, I can't even express what a godsend the, the, these, these, these teachers, these, um, the, these mothers themselves, but especially, especially for, for my experience in the preschool years, when there was so much, it never goes away. The uncertainty never goes away and the needing the support from the teachers never goes away, but it does, it does shift and change as the kids become older. And in, the preschool years, so much of it, you're looking to them almost as like a co-parent 
<laughs> like another parent. And you're like, is yes. my kid, is this normal? Is my kid going to be okay? What, how do I help them when I don't know what to do? And, um, Matthew, so, so the three teachers, Mrs. Kraft, Mrs. Tunney and Mrs. Marino were just three. I mean, all of their preschool teachers have been phenomenal. There's too many, there's too many to list. So I did, sure. I didn't say all the preschool teachers, but these three in particular, um, they got the boys. They, they, they saw what made them shine. They saw how to bring out the best in them. And, um, with, with Matthew and Mrs. Kraft, he just like, you know, he, uh, she she saw what made him tick cognitively and she helped she helped inspire him and and she was oh I have a funny story of like one instance where she just helped when he was like melting during a meltdown and I couldn't it made an imprint it, it imprinted <laughs> mm -hmm. it was it was Halloween and it was my first Halloween with like you know a kid uh, with the one of my kids being in, in a class with costume parties and cupcakes and I was looking forward to that so much as a parent. And Matthew had picked out this race car driver out uh, costume weeks ago from like Blaze and the Monster Machines. And he'd worn it. He'd played in it. He had worn the costume and picked it. And Halloween morning, I, I have no idea. It was, he would have been three. I guess he was three. I don't know. But he just wasn't have didn't want to put the costume on. And I'm like, you're going to put the costume on. <laughs> and he's like, no. And he wouldn't wear it. I... So me, I'm like, you're going to put the costume on. I shoved sure. him in that costume. Like, you know, it was like starfished <laughs> and I take him to school and he's screaming and snot everywhere. And I just kept thinking when we get into the classroom, he will, he will be fine. He'll see the party. He'll get excited. He'll snap out of it and he'll go inside. Nope. <laughs> nope. He just face planted on the floor outside the classroom and he just was hysterical so I remember Mrs. Kraft she comes out she's like he's pretty upset let me see if I can <laughs> like because I'm like ready I'm like near tears myself right because I'm holding these 24 cupcakes of big green monsters that I've made <laughs> and like in this crying kid and so he's ripped off the costume Hulk style Mrs. Kraft I just remember she like lifts him up physically off the floor <laughs> and carries him inside and when I like the 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 um the co-teacher she comes out she's like do you need a hug I'm like I need a hug <laughs> and when I peeked in the door she's got Matthew sitting and she's reading to him the costume is gone and and she settled him down and he was the only kid not in costume for the parade <laughs> but I remember thinking to myself that level of zen is what I aspire to because I did not have it in that moment <laughs> Well, but I feel like when we, we can't have it all the time. And when we don't have it, we have to, we have to hope that there's someone to tag team in. And it's, and it's, it's insane how much we rely on these teachers, especially when they're so little and they're, these teachers are are trying to figure out what makes sometimes 20, 24, 25 different kids tick. No. And yet when they're able to exude that level of compassion, that reaches both the kids and the parents i mean they're like superheroes um i i i remember for mrs tunney and mrs marino um what made such an impression on me was that luke at the time was coming out of the lockdown so he was three years old during a pandemic where we'd be driving by a playground and you'd see the yellow caution tape up because you're not allowed on the playgrounds during that summer and he'd be in the car he'd be like oh it's a playground can we go and we're like sorry buddy it's closed and the sun is shining and the playground's closed and you just see him like like he kind of like just you, you could see him like just just withering in on himself and when he finally got back into the classroom with those two particular teachers over the next year and a half they just helped to, him to blossom and to find his voice again and to, 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 to speak, to speak louder and to not, cause he was like, he was kind of pokey. He didn't know how to use his words. Cause he'd like been removed from a classroom and peers and they just, they helped him to grow. And I, I couldn't like the, the, the level of gratitude for these teachers that bring out the best in our kids when it's even more than we can do as parents. Like I, it's mind boggling. So yeah, that's, I, I I needed them probably more than they realized. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that you had good teachers to help. And 
I mean, I have to tell you, you know, for everybody listening, I think one of the biggest lessons for mothers is that we can't be everything for our kids. And I think sometimes we forget that. We, we try, we, we, and we will, some mothers like, you know, mothers will always be the moms. Like the, the, we have, we have that special role, that special connection. Both of my, my experience has been both of my boys behave very differently for me than they do for teachers. (laughs) And so there's certain things that I can do to help them. And then there's certain things that I just, either they need to figure out on their own or they need an outside source to help them learn, learn that. And it's, that's hard as a parent. That's really hard when you want to help your kid and you feel like you, 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 you can't, that's that like letting, letting go and trusting other people and trusting your village. That's, it's hard, but it's, it's necessary. (laughs) Oh my gosh. All I have to say to that is math class and I'm out. I'm not helping you. <laughs> Find somebody else. Oh, I haven't funny. done that in like 30 years. But... <laughs> so... Oh, man. Gosh. So I love that you say that we need to embrace the Yeti. Can you can mm-hmm. you tell us what that means? Because that's great. It means appreciating the appreciating these big feelings as not being wrong, not being bad. When kids are having tantrums, oh man, it's the worst. But when kids are having tantrums, that's because they're learning how to navigate their feelings. And it's really hard as a parent of a little kid. It's really hard for me right now, even with the, when they're older, when you're not, you, your immediate thought is something's wrong. What do I do? Like, do I, do they need help? Do, is there, is there something, is there someone I need to be talking to? And, um, I found, I mean, now having the hindsight from the younger years, it's, it's nice having 2020 <laughs> hindsight, yes. but during the younger years, a lot of these, a, a, a many of these big feelings were just them learning to self-regulate. That's not, that doesn't make it easy. That doesn't make it like, you know, where you're not trying to keep, of course, you're trying to keep them safe and you're trying to keep your sanity and you're trying to just get through the day, but the big feelings are a part of their growing process. And one of the the main things that I've, that I continue to learn is that it's not just them growing up. It's me growing along with them and growing into the best parent for them. Because I, when I first had Matthew, I thought I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Let's do this. We got this. And then when you realize you have no control over the chaos, I'm like, I, I, (laughs) what do I, I don't, I don't got this. What do I do? But we're growing, (laughs) we're growing as parents too. And it's, that's, that's a hard thing to, to, to come to terms with, to realize that you yourself, as much as you feel like you know how to navigate this, that you, you don't until you've done it. Um, And I I laugh with my oldest and I tell him he's my guinea pig. And I'm like, you just have to, you just have to understand that I'm learning with you, right? Because he's the oldest and I have no idea what junior year in high school entails. I'm doing it with you. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. It's so, it's so true. And, uh, you know, when now, I mean, now looking back, I mean, what their, their big feelings are what made them special. And when I'm going to the preschool classrooms and reading, I'm seeing all those big feelings again from all the little kids. And it's a, it's adorable. And it's just so heartwarming to, to know that that's how they're expressing themselves. Um, it's easier. Uh, it's easier when you're not the one with the kid breaking down in the supermarket, but, <laughs> but when we get to share these stories with each other as parents, then we feel like a camaraderie as well, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I feel like when I'm in the supermarket and I see somebody struggling with their kids, you're like, <laughs> I, yeah, like, I'm like, I'm with you. Like I have yeah. been there. I send you strength and love. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot more. I have a lot more compassion now. I feel like when I see parents struggling, not that I was ever, I was never in the supermarket pre-kids thing like, oh, that parent can't control their child. Who are they? Right. Well, I feel a lot more compassion when I see the kid having a meltdown now. And I'm like, oh man, that's a rough, that's, that might be, that might be a a glass of wine night (laughs) when they get home. (laughs) For sure. 
Absolutely. Yes. Can you tell us, I know that there's different creatures to help the children understand and express. Can you tell us about some of them that, that are in your story? In, in, uh, well, this one is just the Yeti. This now, one's the, just the Yeti. This one's just the Yeti. The, so the whole Mighty Mood series. So it's, uh, there's two more books planned. Oh, there's, yes. There you've got, we've got three books planned so far. And so the, the next characters haven't been revealed yet, but okay, they, okay. they will okay. be soon. So um, stay tuned. Stay tuned. But think larger than life creatures that are silly and zany and that kids will really enjoy reading about and kind of self-identifying with. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> There's lots in the works coming, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, okay. So with all of the parenting that you have done so far, what do you think the best advice is that you have ever gotten or, or received? You have ever given oh. or received, if I could say the question correctly. Um, I, so, I mean, you know, there's, there's just loads, loads of parenting advice. Um, I know we get so much. I, you know, I think the one that I, I've been remembering, um, and it's not, it's not to say that it's the, like the single best piece of advice I've ever gotten, but it's one that's stuck with me for the past almost nine years. Um, when Matthew was first born a, I was, I was really naive. Like, I mean, more of, I thought that I was really in control. And I remember telling my coworkers, cause I was, I was still an editor. Um, I went on maternity leave like three days before I had him. Um, it just, it just so happened. Like I wasn't due for another two weeks, but I, when I left, I told my coworkers, I'm like, I'm going to keep the baby inside until I finish all my projects, wrap everything up. I mean, that was the, the dumbest thing. To, the goal. That was the goal <laughs> to think, to think that I had control over. I did not, but <laughs> I remember when he was a newborn, I just, I, I didn't, I didn't know how to operate without, without, without sleep, without not, not that it was just without sleep, but without any structure. And he was our first. And we had, we had no nap schedule, no, no daily schedule. Uh, it was winter. And so I, we would like, he'd be up all night. We'd finally kind of start our day around 11 or 12, like, you know, cause they're sleep when the baby sleeps and, <laughs> and we'd finally start our day. And then by like two, three o'clock, it was already starting to get dark. And I'm like, Oh my God, the night is starting. Again. <laughs> oh, no. And there was one coworker who I was talking with. And I remember he goes, just let the chaos wash over you. Just, just go with it. Just let it, just let it, Aww. let it wash right over you. And it really stuck with me when he said that because it was a very visual way of, of, of accepting there's just not going to be the same level of control that I was used to. Not right now. <laughs> and, and never, and never truly again, but, but in that very beginning stage, like, you know, there's just, you, you just have to go with it. And the, the the letting go of learning to let go of the control in a healthy way was was I think one of the best parenting advice uh, pieces of advice that I've ever gotten. <laughs> I I think every single one of us who just heard that <laughs> needed to hear that. <laughs> I think I need to hear that over and over. I need again. to keep reminding myself of it and keep being reminded. <laughs> oh my gosh! I when I went over my day today, I was like, one step at a time. Like yes. just em embrace it, love it, go with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you move a mountain, one grain of sand. <laughs> oh my God. I love your advice. Now, I know that a lot of parents struggle to communicate with school. I know that's a big thing. And I know that you have done such a good job. Any advice, <laughs> you're, you're definitely succeeding. I mean, any advice for the parents who are struggling to communicate with the school? I think, I mean, I think the, uh, the, my advice would be to view the teachers, uh, do your best to view the teachers as someone you're working with, not, a, not against there's going to be, there's going to be different personalities all the time. And at the end of the day, you as the parent are your child's biggest ad advocate. So, you mm -hmm. know, if something's not working, if something's not right, but the teacher's you know, my experience has been every single teacher has been trying to do their best to figure out 
what works for the kid or to try to work with the kid. And so I've always approached, I've always tried to approach the, 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 the teachers, like if they're telling, if they're coming to me and saying that something, there's been a problem in class or this happened today, I always try to approach it as how can I help? What can I, what can I do to re, re reiterate what you went over in class at home or reinforce? And, um, I view it as a working collaboratively. Um, I, because, you know, I don't think, I don't think any teacher gets the kid and, and is like, you know, that one, that's the one that I'm going to pick. Like, no, they, they want to help them. And so, you know, it's easy to have, it's very, very easy to have a knee jerk reaction when you hear that something's wrong and be like, well, 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 what was the other kid doing? What was wrong? Like, you know, my kid didn't do anything wrong. But that's not the point of the conversation. The point of the conversation is to help the kid in whatever happened, not to accuse. Um, at least that's that's how I've always tried to approach it. And um, I do find that talking face to face wherever possible or on the phone is much, much better than than emails, because even though even though emails are a necessity, so much gets lost in translation, especially, so especially, especially when it comes to anything school related, it's, di it's different in the preschool years versus the, the, uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the boys were in, in a uh, very small pro like, you know, private church run preschool. When you get into public school, things are different. Each school is, is different and, and in what they're allowed to communicate in writing. So when you're yeah. able to have a conversation, it humanizes it you're able to say, what can we do to work together? We're going to do X, Y, and Z. Um, I try to view it as a, as, as teamwork. <laughs> I love that. I think, I think that people, I think that all of us, you know, can easily go to being defensive teachers too, parents, yeah, teachers. Absolutely. And I think that if we could get rid of defensiveness, even in marriage, <laughs> right? Be, right. If we could yeah. just eliminate defensiveness, I think so many relationships would be so much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 we were very fortunate in the, uh, thinking back to the preschool years, just, we had some very, very loving preschool teachers who I came to view as, as friends and like as, as second, second parent parental or mother figures for the boys. They That's all, they wonderful. loved them. It was so cute. They still, if they see them, they still give them hugs. Oh, I love that. <laughs> now I ha I can't even tell you how many women have said to me that they wanted to write something and mm -hmm. and haven't started and don't know where to start and mm -hmm. any advice to anyone listening who wants to write a book an article something and they just can't get themselves to begin. I mean, can't get themselves to begin. So if you're talking about the actual inspiration, I mean, I the the best thing to do is to I. I it is when I say to just start, I don't mean like to, to come like, you know, oh, just start, but you have to have something on paper before you can move forward. Yes. You have to, if it's, if it's just an idea, that's great, but it will stay an idea until you put it down. And, and it takes, it takes, it takes time. It took, it took a, t a long time to, to, to finesse Yeti. The actual, for me, the actual writing is, is pretty quick, but then the reworking and the, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, shaping and molding into the best version that takes, that takes time. Um, so to, if, so if, if someone's got an idea for a book and they, they really want to give it a go, you, you get it down and you, you get it to a place where you think that it's, it's what you think is like the best, the best possible. And then actually publishing is, is a whole other, is a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know, you know, uh, there's, there's lots of different routes. There's obviously self-publishing is, is huge now, which, which many people do do successfully, um, getting something like officially published. You have to, to, to really find an agent to be your advocate. And my, I, I was, I was like, I was connected with my agent through, through, uh, through, uh, work connections. So, you know, it's like, I'd been in the industry for, over 10 years for 13 years or so. And so it's, it's, it's like any, it's like a career, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's who, you know, who you've made connections with, who you can reach out to. And then in that case, like, you know, like, you know, truly like getting published the traditional way when you have, when you have an agent, that's, that's your advocate. <laughs> that's and, really yeah. good. 
Yeah, no, that's excellent mm -hmm. advice. I hope that somebody listening will start their book today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so is there anything else that you want to share? Because I've asked you so many questions. Um, I, you know, I think, I think the, the, the only other thing that I'm just so excited about is that when I've been reading the book to the kids, because it's, it's, it's written and it's written in rhyme. It's meant to be read aloud. It's meant to be silly and, and fun. And, um, I like, I, I love seeing how the, the kids are responding and are, are reacting to it. That's, that's everything to me to see that they, they're enjoying something that I, I thought up of because awesome. of my own experience that they're able to share that now is, is incredible to me. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to, to share this story with the world. That's, that's crazy to me. <laughs> it's wonderful. Tell everybody where they can find your book and all your books and where they can find you. Sure. So I, so I have a website, which is um, meredithrusu.com. So it's just my first last name and then .com. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Meredith Rusu writes. Um, so it's like my name and then W R I T E S. And, um, so on my website, you can find all of my license titles and all of the book, like, you know, and all of my, um, my, the, my now original work. And on my Instagram, you'll see like, you know, like, um, snippets of my events and where I'm, where I'm doing readings or, um, if there's exciting stuff in the works, that's where we're, we're going to reveal the next characters in the Mighty Mood series. So exciting. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, those are the, those are the two best places to, to find me. And then my books are obviously on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and local, any, any book retailer where fine books are sold <laughs> awesome. and the libraries, of course, too. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I absolutely loved getting to talk to you and learn about the Yeti. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. <laughs> This is Rebecca Green reminding everyone to spend every day laughing, learning, and loving. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you for tuning in to the Whiny Palooza podcast. If you like what you heard, please be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. While you are there, leave a review. I love to hear your feedback. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer. 49 faces looked to him in triumph. Over the last 12 months, they had each taken turns and promoted his business for a week at a time, driving over $987,342 in revenue. What if you had a network of 50 centers of influence who promoted your business every week for a year? Grab your copy of the number one Amazon best-selling book, The Ultimate Guide to Growing Your Business with a Podcast, at 33% off the Amazon price by going to ultimatepodcastbook.com. Again, that website for 33% off the Amazon price is ultimatepodcastbook.com.